Welcome everyone to the ECR keynote for the conference. I'm very excited for this. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you probably heard me say this already before. Um, just leave your, your microphone off during uh, the, the paper. Um, and you can leave your video on if you like or uh, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, if you've got any questions, you can post them in the chat during the paper or if, uh, if you want to wait until the end, uh, you can ask a question via video or, or, or type it into the chat. Uh, over to you, Adele. Well, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Adele Sefton Rouston and I'm a fellow ECR and uh, member of ASL um, committee as well. So I'm delighted to be here to host today's ECR um, keynote. And I'd like to acknowledge that um, I am dialing in from Larrakia country in Darwin and I pay my respects to elders um, past, present and future and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we all um, meet today and add that uh, sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, I've known Kate for I think exactly 12 months now. Uh, we met at the uh, ASIL conference in Perth last year and she has been a great support for the startup of an NT literary journal, Borderlands, and we will have our first print issue uh, in July. So um, I'm really glad to be supporting you, Kate, today um, in, in return for that. Um, and I just have a lot of respect for you as an editor as well as an ECR. I often forget that you are an ECR because you're always so confident. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think uh, you'll agree with me once you, you hear her bio. Kate Noski is a lecturer in creative writing and editor of Westerly Magazine at the University of Western Australia. Kate has been a judge for the ALS Gold Medal, the WA Premier's Book Prize and the TAG Hungerford Prize. She is a board member for Writing WA. She has twice been awarded the Ellen Mitchell Prize for Rural Women's Writers and has received a Varuna Fellowship and was shortlisted for the 2015 Dorothy Hewitt Award. Her debut novel, The Salt Madonna by Picador was released earlier this year. And today she is talking to us um, with a paper entitled Deep Mapping and Lines of Convergence in the Creative Practice of Randolph Stowe. Welcome, Kate, over to you. Thank you, Adele, that's lovely of you. Um, I'm just gonna share screen as a first step. I'm hoping everybody can see that. Um, Adele, do you wanna tell me if you can? Yes, I can see that. Oh, awesome, thanks guys. Okay, so like Adele, uh, I want to begin today by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from Wajak Noongar Buja uh, and pay my respects to the ancestors of this country, to elders past, present and future. Um, I want to pay respect as well to elders across all countries of this digital gathering and I thank the Noongar community as a whole for their continued custodianship of this beautiful Buja. Given the, the subject matter of this paper, I also wish to acknowledge the Umbulgari people, the victims of the Forest River massacres in particular, including those killed at Mbali, and recognise the trauma and suffering that these events have caused. I, I pay respect to all the sovereign peoples of Balangara country, and particularly elders past and present. And finally, I warn you all that this paper touches on the events of these massacres, which may cause distress. I hope to do so in a spirit of respect towards Aboriginal truth-telling in this history. Firstly, uh, before I begin, um, I thank Roger and, and the executive for the invitation to offer this keynote. It's um, really exciting to have the luxury and space of time in offering this paper. Uh, and I'm, I'm enjoying as well the fact that uh, I'm following last year's ECR keynote from uh, Ellen Smith, who was also offered a paper on Randolph Stone, which is uh, a lot of fun. Uh, this is a paper effectively in two parts. They're not equal parts, or it might also have wandered on into a paper of two hours. Uh, but given that we're meeting as a literary studies association, I've privileged that half of my identity in this scholarly work. Um, 
The sense of being pulled in two directions is familiar to many creative writing scholars. Jerry Kroll describes the schizophrenic nature of the undertaking of creative research. While the metaphor is crude, it's also persuasive, particularly for scholars who find themselves situated, as I do, within a literary studies discipline. As a metaphor, it speaks to the strain and anxiety of articulation, facing, for instance, the uh, exegesis within a creative thesis, a challenge for many postgraduates and a component defined differently across different institutions, or facing the need to justify practice in institutional research accounting, comparing creative works to critical, or facing the need to negotiate the politics of non-traditional research outputs in the national context of the ERA. At the same time, while the pull of two parts, two selves can be a source of anxiety, it can also function as a strength. Kroll describes the slippages of meaning and identity which can plague the creative research project, but also the polyphonic discourse it can create as a site that encompasses a range of contesting voices and perspectives. This potential for dynamic multiplicity goes beyond the blending of creative and exegetical forms within creative research. When combined within a faculty or discipline, the perspective offered in creative writing scholarship can complement and enhance engagement with literary studies and vice versa. This is how personally I, I best like teaching uh, and it's part of the reason I love my position here at UWA with creative writing embedded within a broader program of literary studies. Ross Gibson describes the process of scholarly creative practice as based in simultaneous immersion and ex extraction. The artist researcher is inside but also outside but also inside but also outside. The contradiction of the two states produces an energy of its own, inexorably shaping the knowledge produced as immersive and nervous, implicit as well as explicit, and at the very best moments experienced as revelation, as he describes here. Artist researchers have the chance to woo two, notes of, two modes of knowing. They have the chance to entwine the insider's embodied know-how with the outsider's analytical precepts. The attraction between these two modes of knowing must be both felt and spoken and as the world blooms in the artist's consciousness the mutual commitment of the two modes can abide and provide. This is a sensation which is not unfamiliar to researchers coming from either discipline I think and I believe it's a sensation which can be felt in the act of reading as well as writing, one which I think we've also witnessed already in this conference. Other domains are more intertwined than institutional course copies to make them seem. Uh, even the image uh, offered on the creative, uh, offered on the call for fly papers flyer for this conference speaks to the simultaneous connection and distinction between creative writing and literary studies, with each discipline the shadow self of the other, with apologies to Roger for having reproduced it here without prior permission. So I want to begin today by applying that premise to my paper. My approach operates in balancing two distinct trajectories of thought, two disciplinary perspectives, hinged by a single image, a mud map drawn by Randolph Stowe. This image, this hinge, serves for me as an epistemological meeting point. While I move through different practices on either side, I'm turning at all times around that center. The question of how I might engage with the creative practice of another writer and what that might mean in understanding my own. At some point in 1959, stationed in the Trobriand Islands as a cadet patrol officer, Randolph Stowe drew a mud map in the back of his diary, coloured with red and green pastel. Titled Forest River Mission from Memory, it shows the layout of the mission near Wyndham in the Kimberley, where he'd been based for most of 1957, the space which informed and served as the setting for his Mile Franklin winning novel, To the Islands. I want to apologise first up for the quality of these images that I'm showing today. I took them myself in the archives of the NLA, wading slowly through the detailed documents of Stowe's mini boxes and folders. I was at the time researching another paper, looking into Stowe's letters for mentions of Daniel Evans, his oral testimony of the Forest River massacres, which features into the islands as spoken by Justin. I need to acknowledge gratefully before going any further before going any further, sorry, the support of the Stowe estate in allowing me to reproduce these here and in reading and approving the publication of my research. 
but the poor quality of these images speaks eloquently to the moment I first encountered the map on my final day in the archive. Featured in a folder and a journal which came after his time at Forest River, it was unexpected and I was unprepared. I'd opened the journal merely out of curiosity and I took the photos on my phone. The image is essentially out of place with the journal, which is entitled Notes and Texts, one of three which record aspects of bigger Kirawina language on the Trobrians. In Notes and Text, Stowe records word lists, uh, collects jottings, as well as manuscript versions of two short stories, one of which Ellen Smith discussed so beautifully last year. The same journal also includes a map of Kirawina Island with similar language detail drawn within the front cover. The Forest River map is an odd afternote hidden away behind the back cover, shifting the journal into another space and time. All the same, or perhaps because of this, I found it intriguing. Stowe seemingly felt some ambivalence towards his role in working for the colonial government in the Trobrands in 1959. Suzanne Faulkner in her biography of Stowe notes his unease with the insensitivity forced upon them by bureaucratic tasks and his fatigue with the tax collecting patrols. This was the same year that Stowe's father died, that rumours of his homosexuality were potentially spread by locals and he attempted suicide. Undated, it's uncertain at what point in the year Stowe drew his Forest River map, but the connection its appearance in the journal makes between the two spaces is significant for me. It invokes, I feel, the possibility that the tension of this situation in the Trobrians, his distance from home, his uneasiness with the colonial politics at play, might all have invoked memories of a similar isolation at Forest River, the space wherein Faulkner suggests questions of colonialism first tangibly arose for Stowe. The map offers in this a complex rendering of the settler colonial subject. The Forest River map is complete with rivers and tributaries, place names in two languages, a scale and a compass rose. Stowe is no artist, but the map is far more sophisticated than it appears at the first glance. It is suggestive of a desire for precision in the representation of space, something unusual for the average mud map and not found universally in Stowe's journal. This precision suggests both pride and a sense of nostalgia or longing in remembering the forest river space across time and from a distance. It may have been something of a memory exercise perhaps, mimicking the Kirawina map at the front and reasserting against that the connection to a life outside his current situation. But whatever the impulse which led to the drawing, I'd suggest that it replicates a desire for a place in tracing the legacy of an intimate knowledge of it through both language and spatial forms. At the same time, the act of mapping externalises that desire and allows it to be contemplated and or validated. It proves an ongoing possession of knowledge of the place and thus legitimises the connection that Stowe might have been feeling. To map, ultimately, in the colonial con context, is an act of acquisition. It is driven by a logic which traces back to Enlightenment thinking and the taxonomical as a scientific impulse. Elements of a similar classification can be witnessed in Stowe's use of colour. A map like this contains and controls a country by rendering it known. The colonial undertone is made most visible, perhaps, in the clear boundary around the map, the thick black line by which Stone marks the reach of his knowledge in that place. There is a tension in the image between points of contact, points which are familiar, country coloured in lush green, and the empty red space around that. Stowe's novel as a whole is sensitive to the containment and insularity of the local. And the map emphasises this focus in his work. The key points are situated in relation to each other and set within the context of regular movement. The Wyndham River with the boat in and out, for example, and the Mission Centre with the details around. Other landmarks around the map are places which Stowe mentions in his letters and journals or which feature on the labels of his photographic slides. Places that Stowe explored in camping trips uh, and sometimes alone. So we have, for instance, Badaway, which is there, John Mary, which is here in the bend of the river, uh, Almara, which is spelt slightly differently in the mud map, but I think probably the same place, Camera Pool, and uh, Gulgit Mary. The map details thus 
the distinction between terra nullius, an untenable concept in the mission life with people and their culture so def definitively present, and terra incognita. The latter shifts the weight of ignorance onto the settler subject. It stows knowledge of the country, which is established with pride in the detail of the space surrounding the mission, which is deficient in that broad emptiness of red shading beyond. The blank space of the rest of the page helps confirm this. The established imperialist power dynamic between the black and white bodies of the mission is momentarily reversed in this recognition. In the novel, likewise, as soon as the narrative leaves the mission space, it is Harriet who depends on Justin. The scene where Harriet first runs and Justin follows is, I think, made poignant by this shift. I need to recognise, though, before I go any further, that Stowe's novel and a lot of his letter writing is marked by racial prejudice and imperialist assumptions regarding and in representing the Aboriginal people of the mission and later as well, the people of the Trobrians. My understanding of the trauma of such representation is limited by my standpoint as a white reader. I can only imagine, as Anita Heiss called on us to do in her wonderful Barry Andrews address on Monday night, I do not have to live with this. I have not been able to find any published critical response to Stowe's work from an Indigenous scholar. So if anybody listening today knows of any that I haven't seen yet, I'd be very, very grateful if you could put it in chat. What I have found instead is testimony from Doris Morgan, an elder at Mbulgari, cited in Neville Green's History, The Forest River Massacres, published in 1995, and discussed in Kate Leah Rendell's work on Stowe. Morgan's testimony supports details from Daniel Evans' account that appears in Stowe's novel, an account which itself was later published as a standalone text in the bulletin, though with different problematic editing elements, which I've discussed in other works. I offer you these excerpts here in a gesture of recognition. It is important to approach this oral testimony as Aboriginal truth telling and to privilege it over the fictional reworking and appropriation of Evans' account into the islands when acknowledging the massacres. But in terms of assessing Stowe's representation of Aboriginal people, the lack of a critical response from an Aboriginal scholar is problematic. Because of this, I organised through the Westerly Centre earlier this year to invite Munanjali and South Sea Islander academic Associate Professor Chelsea Bond to offer the 2020 Randolph Stowe Memorial Lecture. She critiqued the Australian history of white writers representing black bodies and described the social and cultural impacts of that literary heritage in Australia. In her fierce and powerful and beautiful lecture, she told us that she found to the islands, quote, impossible to read. At the same time, in white critical responses to the novel, Stowe is often praised as progressive and sensitive in a way that other writers of his era were not. Uh, Bernadette Brennan suggests in her introduction to the text classic edition of the novel that Stowe was one of only a handful of white writers who sought to portray Aboriginal characters with depth and complexity, something she celebrates in his work, along with the manner in which he brought this concern to the literary mainstream. Klaus Newman similarly applauds Stowe's representation of the massacre's continuing effects in the novel, with the massacre a historical context to the contemporary tension of the narrative. Newman takes up the novel as a means of historicising contemporary responses to the Forest River massacres, including Rod Moran's shocking denial that they occurred, published in the West Australian as late as 1994. Newman is interested in the ethics and self-awareness of writing history around massacre, and he sees, sees Stowe's novel as, quote, before its time in doing this. <clears throat> Sorry. The massacre history is indeed overt within the novel. It's carried by the use of Daniel Evans' testimony, which, allows, which Stowe allows to stand as an interruption to the narrative and largely in Evans' voice, as far as we can tell. Though there is ultimately a serious cultural appropriation in his use of this in the fiction form. At the same, the same history is potentially in evidence in the map as well, by the marker of a cross at the mission site. A cross is mentioned in both Evans' and Morgan's oral testimony as the place where the massacre remains were eventually interred, and the site was photographed by Stowe while there. 
These two perspectives, while in set, unsettling in comparison, should not be seen as mutually exclusive. I want to stress that I love and I've long enjoyed Stowe's writing and I don't offer this context in any sense of running him down. It's entirely possible to see Stowe as better than many mid-century writers in his representation, but to acknowledge simultaneously that this is ultimately a low bar to set. I found myself needing to sharpen my sensitivity to that in responding to Stowe's work. And this reading of Stowe's work does not likewise diminish our responsibility as literary critics to listen to voices such as Chelsea Bond's and call out the problematic elements of the novel. If anything, understanding Stowe's work as comparatively progressive makes Bond's response all the more alarming and imperative. To me, this means tracing the effects and assumptions of the settler colonial mindset through Stowe's work. Uh, to, in order to understand that perspective, my inheritance of it as a white reader and the legacy it has created in contemporary Australia, ultimately with the aim of beginning to decolonize my reading and writing practices. To return to the text with this in mind, it's necessary to develop a reading which is conscious of the assumptions underlying the settler colonial perspectives it holds. If we can read a tension of containment in Stowe's mud map, then it's possible that a similar tension might be at play within to the islands of the novel. The clear boundaries around the mission space in the map, setting it as part of a larger page, create an imperialist focus. This replication of detail, containment and expanse can be read as offering us a key to the opening of the text. The detailed engagement with place and setting is not purely a literary strategy in Stowe's writing, but suggestive, I think, of a deeper tension in positionality. It is marked by a complex feeling of connection to place, undercut by a simultaneous recognition of the violence and displacement across the colonial history of that country, and an uneasiness and concern regarding the perpetuation of this in the mission. The same dichotomy between the known local centre and the overwhelming beyond can be read in the opening pages. The sequence of Harriet's morning, starting in his hut and expanding slowly outward, moves across almost all the mission buildings, either through Harriet's viewpoint or in witnessing the directions taken by others. Harriet woke, his eyes not yet broken to the light, rested on the mud brick beside his bed, drifted slowly upwards to the grass-thatched roof. From a rafter, an organ grinder lizard peered sideways over its pulsing throat. Oppressed by its thatch, the hot square room had a mustiness of the tropics. On the shelves of the rough bookcase, Harriet's learning was mouldering away. In the Oxford books of this and that, and in old-fashioned dictionaries, all showing more or less the visitations of insects and mildew. Outside, the crows had begun their restless crying over the settlement, tearing at his nerves. The women were coming up to the kitchen. He could hear their laughter, their rich, beautiful voices. We're taught in this passage both to see detail and paradoxically, paradoxically an expansiveness, a movement constantly drawing the eye outward. We move from Harriet's waking uh, to the rafters above him, to the thatch, to the hot square room, to the details of that room, and then outside and beyond. This, uh, this uh, in a literal sense, uh, offers us a map of the key elements of the mission. In the pages proceeding from this point, we, feel Harriet, uh, we follow Harriet's path to the shower, to shave and to the office. We follow a gun through the village to the church and then Helen from the church via mention of the nurse's station and the boat at the landing to the office again. But already here in this opening, the mission space is made small by Harriet's consciousness of and gaze towards the beyond. Deep in fading grass, the country stretched far away from the hut, between the rocky ridge and the far blue ranges, dotted with white gum, uh, yellow flowering green trees, which also harboured goats, creepers, all rustling reptiles, rose the mission. The ramshackle hamlet of huts and houses, iron and mud brick and thatch, quiet below the quiet sky. This same manoeuvre is repeated with each new perspective. The detail of the mission is constantly placed in the larger context of the openness beyond. Behind the church in his cassock, smoking a last cigarette before the service, Father Way gazed absently up at the new sun overhanging the distant blue hills. 
He looked around as the gun came, to, came up. Together, they looked at the high cliff across the river and found it burning red with morning light, rising above the green of guns and barbs on its banks. Now and at sunset, Wei said, you can see that for miles. The characters' names, Wei and Gun, tie in symbolically uh, to the ideological and physical violence of colonisation. And for Gun, shortly after, the distinction between mission and country is taking on, uh, begins to take on an element of cultural identity. The country had taken him in. There was, first of all, the easy affection of the children brought up to expect from an adult nothing else but affection. And from then, his feeling had extended to their parents and older siblings, the bush nomads, the rocks and waters of the land itself. The phrase, grey nana ga, my country, so often in their mouths, would keep recurring to his mind. Beneath the paternalistic and imperialistic categorization and representation of the people here is an acknowledgement of an alternate cultural perspective, perhaps even a subtle or subconscious distinction between who does and does not have the right to speak of country. The use of language in the pronoun my suggests an awareness and acceptance of sovereignty. In contrast, Gunn does not speak but can only recall the phrase. Gunn's feeling is centered within the mission expanding outwards in the same way Harriet's gaze sets the mission as small in the expanse of country and quiet beneath the expanse of sky. But at the same time, both these examples are marked by an underestimation of the white characters, and I suspect Stowe, as to what country actually signify. Gun in this passage assimilates my country with physical land. It is the rock and waters which bring this phrase to his mind. As Noongar writer Dougie Nelson describes, however, it is of paramount importance not to misinterpret the meaning and the powerful essence of the word country as it is used by Aboriginal people. Country is not a differentiation between urban and rural or remote areas. It does not simply consist of an open area or location of land. It is not an inanimate tangible object to be seen as picturesque for its natural beauty or a wilderness for admiration of its landscape. Country is not a product for economic utilisation as a commodity to be sectioned off as people of pieces of land. Country is the embodiment of all living entities situated within country. This includes people, land, sky, wind, tree, rock, kangaroo, honey ants, rivers and everything else. All that country contains is alive and to speak of country is to speak of all that country involves. This idea of country is clearly incompatible with that offered in Gunn's perspective and that demonstrated by the dividing black line between known and unknown in Stowe's mud map. The map ultimately dismisses the unknown country in containing its idea of place within that boundary and focus. In the same way, Harriet dismisses country and is corrected by Justin at the point of his first running away. Go back, Justin, I'm going on alone. Justin asks stubbornly, where are you going? You know, I told you. You don't really go to those islands. I'm going to a place no one comes home from. You understand an order, Justin. I don't want you here. Justin said with perfect deference, I got to come, brother. Go back to Ella and your children. It's your duty. You understand that. Stephen, look after Ella and the little kids, brother. I'm going nowhere, Harriet said. Nowhere. A desperate anger in his frozen eyes. You don't know that country. For this brief moment in the dialogue, Justin's response marks sovereignty in that space and the ignorance of colonial assumptions. But at that point that Harriet relents and allows Justin to join him, Stowe's narratorial response undoes this again, working through Gothic stereotypes and the colonial assumption of terra nullius. The, the sentence which follows this dialogue, behind the uneasy trees rose the hills and beyond them again, the country of the lost huge wilderness between this last haunt of civilization and the unpeopled sea. Harriet's journey as, this, as it follows from this point, likewise holds parallels to colonial exploration, something Ross Gibson has referred to as a traversal account. Bay's wiki in, Lyra, in, in the pawn shop notes the preponderance of nature metaphors in the novel. Those descriptions of bodies, both black and white, regularly feature trees, birds and animals. 
Zwicky argues that Stowe implies that man is simply one form of life, no more and no less. He is not superior to his environment, but merely an example of its power to assimilate, uh, sorry, to assimilate him into its features. It is an attractive ideal, this attempt to find for man some permanence and meaning in his relationship with the environment by means of an imaginative merging with it. Zwicky's essay in itself illustrates a deep assumption of terra nullius and is like Stowe's work, symptomatic of its moment in contemplating Australian literature is inherently white. And while I disagree with the first element of this response, I see uh, that idea of man as simply one form of life as something more desired in the text, something unstable more than directly implied. This idea of this, the idea of this merging with nature as an ideal in the work can, I think, be felt in, at this moment of Harriet's journey commencing. The idea of the settler subject struggling to find permanence and convey meaning in his or her relationship with the environment speaks to Stowe's mud map as well as the novel, in the sense that the map suggests in Stowe a desire to configure himself through that connection to place. This conversation with the map has been, however, reading the map as a text, reading it alongside to the islands as supporting a complex and multivalent set of meanings which cannot be reduced to any fixed interpretation. It is essentially to ignore the sense that a map would usually have a key and undermine thus the assumption of direct and concrete representation which is inherent to geospatial information systems as a whole. And this really is where I reach the hinge in my paper. Encountering this map in Stowe's archive and feeling its potency as a text has led me to contemplating whether it is possible in creative practice to work back in the opposite direction, to write text as a map. And what might doing so offer in speaking back to the legacy of colonial mapping that white Australian writers have inherited in rendering Australian spaces. Part of the intrigue in Stowe's map for me personally was how familiar it felt as a gesture within my own creative practice. In the 10 years I worked on my novel, The Salt Madonna, um, I drew several maps like this one. This map, while dense and offering less of the detail shown in Stowe's drawing, was one of many which attempted to capture topographical depth alongside geospatial uh, features of my setting, such as uh, given that the, the, the topographical was essential in movement in the work. In looking at Stowe's map, I became immediately conscious of the fun how fundamental this had been to my process in writing. And I was struck too by the parallels between the practices of so spatial engagement surrounding it. Like Stowe, in my writing, I became an amateur photographer uh, and I took many photos tracing the feature of the map in image form. And like Stowe, my novel opens with a description of the place through focalised movement. Like Stowe, my setting was placed based on a real place as well. The mapping as an activity in my creative practice was fundamental in shifting into fiction a space that was well known as me, the place well known to me, sorry, the place I grew up, Portland in southwest Victoria. In my novel, the landscape of my home was reimagined as an island named Chesil. The name itself holds a thread of this connection. Chesil Beach in England is a shingle beach connecting the Isle of Portland to the British mainland, just as Chesil as an island is both connected to and disconnected from my home. But in critiquing Stowe's map and reflecting on its familiarity, I became conscious of the same colonial imperatives playing out as assumptions within my own work. Mapping as an act holds implicit the inheritance of interpreting country geospatially. Considering this in my own practice became a question not only of what I put into mapping, but what concept of a map I was bringing as an assumption to my development of the text. It meant recognising the instinct to map and all it implied as a conscious practice. The long gestation of my writing drew attention likewise to the temporal as an element of mapping. Returning to the maps I'd drawn in years prior, they were in some ways strange and unexpected. Their moment and the impulse they traced had passed. Ultimately, they sought to encapsulate an ex a specific experience of being in place with full emphasis on the indeterminacy of in as a preposition. They anticipated and expressed 
not just the relation between subject and environment being within place, but also a specific lived iteration of subjectivity, which emerged through that relation of subject environment and environment within the moment of the map's drawing being through place or being via place. In the project I've commenced since I finished writing my novel, a creative non-fiction manuscript which mix, mixes poetry and essay, mapping has become a central intrigue and tension. On the 5th and 6th of August in 2017, a good friend and I spent a weekend walking 39 kilometres along the Bibbulmun Track in the Darling Range, southeast of Perth. It was not a long walk by track standards or a particularly arduous one. We were not experienced or fit for it. We devised our plan on a whim and we chose our entry and exit points based on easy car access. Our overnight camp was based on the closest approximation of a midpoint between. We had no GPS, so we were reliant on a map in finding ourselves as we walked. The map we took was published in collaboration by the track's managing body, the WA State Government Department of Parks and Wildlife's Recreation and Travels Unit, and the Bibbulmun Track Foundation, or the BTF, a non-for-profit organisation established to provide support for the management, maintenance and marketing of the Bibbulmun Track, as they describe themselves. The map is accompanied by a guidebook, which is pictured here, published by the BTF alone. This is a, uh, there is a complicated history suggested in the publication details of the guidebook, with various past versions listed as solely released by the department or by the BTF. The version with which we've walked, published in 2014, was described as, quote, completely revised edition of its predecessor, which was published in 2002 by the department. It's unclear in reading these opening pages how closely the BTF and the department are associated. There is both a connection and some tension suggested between them. The claim to knowledge implied with, within the revisions comes with undertones of possession and authenticity. This is made even more uncomfortable by the double page of corporate sponsor logos which follow immediately after the BTF's potted history of publication in the opening guide, uh, pages of the guidebook. And while the map includes a standardised acknowledgement of country, as does the website for the BTF, at no point in the front matter of the guidebook publication is an acknowledgement made, despite the name of the track being drawn from the name of an Aboriginal people, the Bibbulmun Noongar Nation of Southwest WA, where the track ends, and the Woggle, a serpent spirit of the Noongar Nations and central to their dreaming, being used as both the symbol for the walking markers on the track and the BTF's logo, shown here on the front cover of the guidebook. Contemplating this dispossession before our walk had made me uneasy. The corporate and governmental structures supporting our entry to the track were clearly arranged according to a principle of legal ownership and control, a contemporary manifestation of terra nullius. In hindsight, the Bibbulmun map does the same work of externalising and thus legitimising a narrative of possession in place that I can see in Stowe's mud map. The same unease that he was feeling in, uh, in writing in the novel and in the mud map is the same unease I felt now, I think. But where in Stowe's map I read this as a personal and even subconscious desire of the settler subject, in the Bibbulmun map, this operates on a social and institutional level. It sets a relationship between the settler society and the pace based on terra nullius and allows that to be communicated and ratified by that society. This capacity within the contemporary map is heightened by 21st century technologies, the manner in which satellite offers a globalised perspective of the Earth from above, an object, an object which can then be rendered, controlled and possessed. The scale and movement possible in Google Maps or Google Earth, for instance, dramatically expands our awareness of the legislative function of geospatial maps, offering us borders and boundaries on a local level. Imagine the highlighting of a search suburb and contextualises them within the scale of nation, the coastline of the country. Jack Kern, in his recently submitted and really fascinating thesis, points to this as a feature of the Anthropocene, which by definition sets humans as controlling the earth and the term containing our conceptualisation of the earth within human activity. 
In attempting to work away from this, my current project responds to the temporal experience of the walk in a work which seeks simultaneously to question the instinct to map and to offer a new act of mapping to overlay the BTF publications. As an aside, I want to resist using the word new uh, to want to resist in using the word new to suggest innovation as an end goal, end goal in and of itself. Instead, I mean new here in more epiphanic terms, thinking of the capacity for the literary text to offer complex revelations in this project in the subjective relation to both place and the natural world that place as a concept encodes. The work is collaborative. Uh, it involves my resident GIS expert, who also happens to be my husband. And working with Lucas, I'm taking poems written from journal notes and photographs and geolocating them through title references corresponding to the BTF guidebook. The related waypoint in the trail guide can be identified in the title of each poem by the numerical reference to section, kilometre, map and page of the guidebook, travelling north-south on the track. Lou is then reworking these poems as maps, drawn using satellite data related to that location. The maps are structured through the text with essays emerging from each, exploring the ideas and tensions that each map is built on. It's been a slow collaborative process working together. We started this writing in 2018. Uh, possibly because of very different perspectives that we each bring to the projects and possibly because we still have to live in the same house. But as an example, this map emerged from a poem which narrated walking the spine of a ridge. Uh, it is based on the watershed data from the same location and shapes thus the topographical features created by water runoff. The essay, which follows, expands on water across that section of the track. It touches on Mundaring Dam, the reduced rainfall expected in climate change, water security and the ecological impact of water shortage on the surrounding bushland. This is a practice which as a whole is deeply embedded in the systems of mapping and rendering space. There's no escaping the legacy of colonial systems in representing land as implicated in this work. My aim in Instead is to actively draw attention to these and to make them strange. Having become more aware via Stowe of the insidiousness with which the assumptions of settler colonial subjectivity undercut my writing practice, it has become important to me to make mapping a conscious aspect of the work. Insisting on the temporal dimension of this mapping is in part an effort towards the creation of a deep map, a term which gained traction first in William Least Heat Moon's Prairie Earth, a deep map published in 1999. It's a work which documents the author's travel across Chase County, county in central Kansas, and combines geospatial mapping with commonplace book, creative nonfiction in a quasi journal style, and critical reflection in a more journalistic form of writing. Invested in eco critical philosophical stance, Pete Moon opens with a multiplicity of voice. His introduction crossings opens with a map of Chase County before expanding outwards, as every section does, with From the Commonplace Book, a selection of fragments and quotes playing regularly on the idea of the map and turning around political and ecological specificity of Kansas as a scene. Early in the work, Heat Moon lets the page stand in literally for the world around him. Excuse me, Kate, just letting you know that we're approaching 40 minutes. Beautiful, last page, thanks very much. Pete Moon suggests, let this book page, appropriate as it is in shape and proportion, be Chase County. Lay your right hand across the page from right edge to left, tuck middle finger under palm and splay your other finger wide so that your thumb points down, your little finger nearly upwards. You have the configuration of the county watercourses, a manual topography of the place. Uh, it took me a couple of goes to try and work that one out. But this sleight of hand pushes immediately against the map already drawn for us in the pages before, a more geospatially accurate map, which demonstrates the ways in which that same map will be reimagined and pulled apart by the writing moving across it and through it in different ways. The view from Ronega Hill, the scene of this introduction, is divided into a grid of 12, which is replicated in the 12 chapters of the text. And each section from there is located with the use of petroglyphs working as a key. Geospatial reference is both upheld 
and pulled apart in the detail of his attention. The multiplicity of voice running through the text acts to expand the temporal uh, references of the moment in time experienced through that writing. The revealing of this structure occurs in the work through a journal entry, which tests to see whether it will work. I'm not waiting for revelation, he says, only watching to see whether my notions will crumble like these old eroding slopes. Despite the manifestation of the text, this is a possibility which is left open, both in the moment and in Heat Moon's broader approach. It is a possibility which I feel moving in my own work as well. Its greatest value may turn out to be nothing more than its function as an exercise for me in questioning mapping within my own writing practice. Heat Moon's work has met with a mixed response since publication, specifically for the exclusion of female voices in the text, but it has been seminal. Other critics and writers have taken up the concept of the deep map and drawn it forward from Heat Moon's early iteration, including in the domains of architecture and design, as well as writing. One of my favourites is Alice Oswald's Dart, which could be taken as a contemporary literary deep map. Dart, a long form poem, takes on the voice of the river, its people, the creatures who inhabit it, the forces of time and history moving around it. Oswald introduces us to the reader deliberately in a prologue, describing the work as, quote, a sound map of the river, a song line from the source to the sea. There are indications in the margin where one voice changes into another. These do not refer to real people or even fixed fictions. All voices should be read as the river's muttering. The audacity of this surprises me every time I read it. It shakes my assumptions about language and voice and the way in which literature could engage with place. It leads me to wonder why I'm drawn to poetry in this work, in this experience of walking the Bibbleman. Poetry is not my normal form and it tends to be an ancillary activity around my broader writing. But language as a whole seemed to naturally fragment and dissolve as we walked. We talked in bursts of conversation, we fell backwards into silence. And in poetry, I find myself more sensitive to the voices beyond my, no my own, to the strident notes of the map, it's turning of our attention to the weather, and particularly the wind, the trees speaking both obstruction and shelter. The hills spoke as audibly through our muscles as the sounds made by our tongues. Responding to Stowe's mud map from the midst of this creative process, its voice too speaks loud. The iterative looping of map and text in my reading is one I'm attempting to replicate in my writing trying to reverse the trajectory of imperialist assumptions within the same settler colonial subjectivity. And like Harriet, like Heat Moon, I'm watching to see if all my notions in this space will crumble. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kate. I'm going to turn on my video so I can give you a round of applause. <laughs> um, that was fascinating uh, and thank you so much for taking us deep into the archives uh, to explore rich photos and drawings from Randolph Stowe. It makes absolute sense that uh, an ECR from WA um, would explore such complex questions um, around the settler colonial landscape. Um, I suppose just while... Hi. 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 Hey, how's it going? Oh, I think someone may not have their microphone muted. <laughs> um, so we do have time for questions. So if people were um, thinking of what they'd like to ask Kate or what they would like to say in response, you can either upload those comments into the chat box or um, prepare your microphone. And Joe is here as well to help me um, manage that. And I suppose while people are just preparing that, um, Kate, I had a, a question slash comment, I suppose, um, thinking about this idea of um, poetry and the subjective self and the way that you're exploring the spatial um, landscape. I'm just wondering, how are you finding that to translate into more of the emotional um, landscape? Are you interested in any, in any reader response theory to this yeah, project? Yeah, I, I have been a little bit. Um, I, I, I'm quite 
taken in, in terms of theories around reading with Michelle Louise Rosenblatt's idea of reading as a live event and the reading and the text uh, being accompanied by the moment as um, you know, an, an individual experience. Um, and I think that's something that you know, is really fascinating me and the idea of, of this poetry is temporal this sense that the reading will in effect extend that moment and extend the, the scope of the deep math and trying to make space for that in the reading has been an interesting, you know, sort of challenge in the work as well. Uh, and part of that using a lot of um, alternate texts to interweave through as, as different voices and as different perspectives, um, you know, suggesting the, the layers of literary study and, and the layers of, of deep the cultural theory that might be brought to this space in this moment. Yeah, seems yeah. reminiscent of Kim Hood's Craft for a Dry Lake and the deep maps that she draws uh, with lots yeah, of colours look, as well. Yeah, and, and not even just the maps drawn, but I mean, Steph, Stephen Cordy has got a, a comment in chat about, yeah, the sort of mapping undertaken by Miyuki Rowan Bentarek in Introduction to Nomadology. And absolutely, that's that's completely relevant. And I think the, the idea of, of slightly alternate mapping practices, Ross Gibson does a lot of this as well, um, and, and layers, you know, works from Google Earth or, or Google uh, Street View uh, in a poetic text. Um, those, those works that are open to that multiplicity is, uh, that sort of multiplicity is, is important when considering how we might explode our assumptions of a map containing and defining so rigidly. Um, Stephen, you, you're talking about collaborative works escaping the trapping of settler colonial spatial representations. Um, and yeah, I think there is, there is an element of that possibility within it, but at the same time, I don't want to um, ever suspect that I can escape my own viewpoint in that, that collaboration can help me become aware of the, the ideas um, around me and aware of the alternate perspectives I might bring to country. Um, but personally, in my own writing, I still need to be conscious of privilege and, and perspective at all times. So I think there's a difference between the collaborative text produced and, and how that functions for a reader in offering um, multiplicity of voice and the experience of collaboration for a white writer and, and what sort of respect one could bring to that. Sorry, I've carried on there and jumped into the, the chat, but thank you for the comments that are there. They're really interesting. Do we have more comments or questions people would like to upload or feel free to turn your mic on and jump in? And I'm reading Donna's question comment there, and I wondered if you had a oh, comment on I that. I must have missed that one. Sorry, hold on a moment. Um, it's just under Stefan's. Ah, oh, I haven't been scrolling down. There's my problem. Yeah, I, I basically I agree. I, I think seeing the map really um, shook my assumptions in coming to the novel. And, and made me conscious of things in the novel that I had been neglecting, I think, before then, uh, in terms of, of not just the, the balance in power, but also in the representations of bodies as well as place. Um, and I think there's, there's really, really interesting ramifications to the way in which Stowe contains place. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I think the next thing I'd like to think about is is how that might be reflected in the representation of bodies in place as well, and and what sort of containment is going on there at the same time. Um, but yes, yeah, so I I think yeah, finding finding the map did vastly change the novel for me. Um, it was a strange moment seeing it.
And we have a question from Megan and then Roger. Is it okay to speak it? I know I've been oh, in that. Hey Kate, that was magnificent. Thank you. Um, I've done a, a little bit of work and something that I'm thinking about in relation to Lindsay's uh, use of Creswick as a basis for his fictional writing is the idea that a space can be both real and imagined at the same time and that the imagined overlays the real and how those inform each other. Do you think that has possible considerations for Stowe's work? I think it does, particularly in the sense that, you know, place is always imagined. And mm. Emily Potter and Bridget Magner have done some awesome work on um, place making in the, the Mali region, for instance, showing how that that is, um, you know, that, that sense of place is, is a social construct ultimately. And that there is, you know, saying that there is a place is, is always pointing to a concept rather than a, a physical environment. So when, you know, we talk about place making in a literary sense and the representations of place in writing, we're ultimately abstracting what is already abstract. And the, the process, I think, that is demonstrated in Stowe's archive of a continued turning around place and the continued imagining of it through jottings, through maps, through the collection of um, little overheard snippets of dialogue, um, when when he gets to England, there's a whole journey. Uh, there's a whole journal in his later archive, which is just um, conversations heard on the ferry, and the journal is literally conversation. It, it's literally titled that, and the whole thing is is transcribed snippets of conversation in local voices. So I think yes, that that process of Stowe's imagining of place in all those different ways is a very active element in his writing, which can be. Um, critiqued as, as part of yeah that that wider tendency to to, to make place abstract or conceptualized um, and in my own writing too I mean you know I wrote from memory in writing about my childhood home but found that to be too difficult in some ways the, the place had to be fictionalized it had to be um, detached from memory in order for me to be, feel free to write in that space and to take it up as, as an imaginative domain And Roger had a fun question about page design, Kate. How do you plan oh. to represent? <laughs> <laughs> this is a topic we no longer bring up over the dinner table. Um, it's It's been an interesting conversation between Lou and I as to how we will actually ever make this work as a text at the moment. We're more deeply invested in how the different elements of it can speak to each other and how they can be um, productive in their relationship with each other and, and literally what, what they can produce as each new map leads to new thinking and new possibilities for us. Uh, I think um, instinctively for me, text and image and map will need to have separate spaces in any published collection, whether that be separate pages for each manifestation. Um, and there's, there's an idea in that, in, in Heat Moon's work as well, of each page layering a new level onto the map uh, so that when you hold the book closed in front of you, the, the depth of the book reflects the depth of those layers over the place, which I think is, is quite a cute idea in terms of having different layerings of different text over the place. I'd almost suggest <laughs> digital design, but we still can't escape colonial uh, constructs yeah, of, of I don't digital think that space. Does. Yeah, and and I'm also nowhere near as good at digital imagining, so I think <laughs> I'll stick to, to the page as the space that works best for me. Well, we still have two minutes left. If anyone... I've just seen a comment from David about Stowe's sense of imagined space. And... Yeah, I, I agree that it's a very tricky one in relation to Indigenous sense of country. And again, it comes with that idea of standpoint theory being important to keep forefront in, in the approach, uh, both in criticism and in creative work. I, I don't really have a response to that other than to say yes, basically, and, and something that is definitely to be negotiated in the work.
Okay. Ah, uh, yes. Penny. Hi, Penny. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. I just thought about, I was listening um, to Daniel Browning on a, on a way um, with Vicky Cousins and Dr. Doris Patton, Patton um, this week, and she, they were discussing deep listening, and I just thought that was an interesting way of mapping as well. You know, even um, they were saying even silence is part of the mapping, which I just thought is another... Yeah. layer again, I don't know. And I think not only silence, but blank space on a page uh, in the same way that reading the blank page or the blank space around Stowe's map is just as important as reading the, the detail. Um, for me, yeah, the idea of deep listening is, is most powerful when taken as a sort of ethical approach to First Nations work. Mm -hmm. And the idea is as well as Anita Heiss was saying in her beautiful lecture of um, upholding Indigenous voice, making space for it, offering representation and, um, you know, helping to um, lift it up within one's work as a centre for, for other thinking. Um, I think that's, that's going to be an important element of any work which contemplates mapping. Um, so marking through that respect to voice you know, that ethics of listening and that ethics of attention and care in, in you know, offering those voices and, and recognising those voices. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the deep listening, I think, has different trajectories of, of reference and, and importance in this work in that way. Thanks, Kate. I think that's uh, a really good comment to finish on if there were no further questions or, or comments and uh, just like to thank everyone for coming and, and being part of that deep listening um, that uh, you've inspired us um, to do today, Kate, and I can't wait to read some of the poetry in your collection of nonfiction. Um, it's really exciting. So do really wish you all the best. And if Thanks. we could uh, thank Kate once more um, for a wonderful ECR keynote. Thanks.